for being here. Um, I thought as part of this talk that if I like asked you to all put your ringers on loud and if you got a spam call during this talk, like giving you a prize, but I figured that might be like, a little distracting, but I don't, has anybody gotten a spam call today? Like half the audience, what about this week? Yeah, so I mean, obviously this is a problem. This is an actual photo of like my missed calls from this month. Um, you know, it's starting to go a little bit lower with some of the uh, measures that telephony companies are putting into place. You can see there that companies like Haya are adding, a, it's a little bit small, but adding like spoofing information into the call log. You know, this might be a potential scam call. I know I'm not unique in this. You are not unique in this, unfortunately. This is a huge problem in the US especially right now. The average person is getting about 14 unwanted uh, or spam calls every month. Um, and while some of these are flagged as spam, that you know, that's useful. What if we could do something a little bit different and start to verify callers? Like do this kind of like identity verification on phone numbers and you laugh, but like this whole talk is kind of about that, right? Like this is the idea that we're trying to move towards because we do this with websites, we do this with emails, so why can't we do this for phone numbers? And the short answer is that we can. Kind of, uh, and I'm going to be telling you about what the uh, the technology behind this is doing, what the regulations that are going to be in place to enforce this. It's a TLS-like technology uh, that's been developed to solve the call authentication problem. It's called Shake and Stir, which is an egregious backronym for some stuff that we'll get into later, uh, and. Just to give you a little bit of an overview of some of the stuff that we're going to be talking about, the history of why this is a problem, you know, security is in quotes there very intentionally. I'm going to get into some definitions and the technical specs behind Shake and Stir and what that is actually doing under the hood, uh, what the US specifically is doing to enforce the implementation of this technology, and where the limitations of this are, right? This is not going to be a silver bullet for solving this problem, but it is a giant step forward towards restoring trust in telephony. Uh, so thank you for the introduction. My name is Kelly Robinson. I work at a company called Twilio. Is anybody familiar with Twilio? Uh, we are a communications company. Uh, a lot of people and most of our business comes from providing APIs for phone calling. Uh, so both sending and receiving voice calls, uh, making and receiving uh, text messages. I work specifically on our account security products for things like Authy, two-factor authentication APIs, phone verification, email verification, and things like that. Uh, so this talk is going to be getting into some of the stuff that I have learned just from like working in the organization and some of the things that they're doing to uh, make sure that Twilio is compliant with these uh, regulations. But also this is mostly just a general introduction to these topics and what you're going to start seeing in the industry over the next 18 months. So again, telephony security, security in quotes. Uh, this is intentional because security in the telephony networks isn't really there. And a big reason for this is when telephony systems were introduced, you know, over a hundred years ago, there was a monopoly of company, you know, it was AT&T, they were the only ones that existed. And even as recent as 30 years ago, the telephony network like pretty much looked like this. It was private, it was closed, they were using a lot of proprietary technology, and there were just a couple of companies that all trusted each other. They all had their protocols for talking to like the other three companies that they needed to talk to, and they knew how to communicate with each other on these closed networks. There wasn't a lot of need for security in that kind of system because of the limited access to the system itself. But if you fast forward to what this looks like today, you know, you can compare that there's thousands of companies and thousands of what we call service providers that have access to the telephony network now. And this is just in the USA. Uh, and so you can kind of start to think about the difference in like the telephony network and what it used to be to the telephony network today is like, it was basically like on-prem hardware, and now you, you can use a telephony network in a similar way that you use AWS, or even something like more advanced on top of that, or more abstracted, like Netlify. Like you used to have to deploy code like with your own servers and have to buy your own servers and set that up yourself, and now everything is cloud-based, everything is like IP-based, and so it's so much easier to access the telephony network now, and that of course causes all of these trust and authentication and security problems. But it's also relatively too easy to access. There's now this standardized technology, and there's also all these different paths that a call can take, which makes tracing calls inside of the network a lot harder. 
Uh, so before we go on, I have to give a little bit more context and some telephony terms. So how many of you like know things about telephony? Okay, there's like five of you. Cool, you can help me out here if there's questions. But for the rest of you, like this is some new stuff that I wanted to give a little bit of background on. So I'm going to be using some of these acronyms. PSTN is the Publicly Switched Telephony Network or Telephone Network. And so this is going to be all of your analog and digital systems for connecting calls around the world. This includes things like cellular networks, uh, undersea fiber optic cables, copper telephone lines. This is anything that allows people to uh, across the globe to complete telephone calls. Uh, there's also VoIP, which some of you might be a little bit more familiar with that term. Voice over IP, internet connected telephony. Uh, this is what a lot of mobile infrastructure and business calling is actually on today. Uh, and this is relevant because we're also going to be talking a lot about SIP, or the Session Initiation Protocol. And so this is a way that people initiate VoIP calls and other communications. It doesn't just have to be calling. But a lot of what SIP refers to is initiating voice calls. It's kind of like an HTTP request for web requests. Uh, SIP in contains metadata and instructions about the call, and this includes things about like where a call is coming from, who it's going to, and that kind of information. And so this is important to note because shake and stir will only apply to SIP-initiated calls. Uh, and finally, the last acronym that I want to introduce is what's called a PBX, or a private branch exchange. Does anybody know if your company has a PBX? Yeah, used to. That's a great answer, right? So this is, uh, unfortunately, there's still a lot of companies that still do. So this is a private network. What used to happen is there was a lot of companies that, like, getting a con or an access point to the PSTN was very expensive. And so what large enterprises would do is they would reduce the number of outside access points to the PSTN and then basically set up, like, an internal network that was all hardwired within your actual physical office so that you could just dial someone's extension and not have to actually connect connect to a public telephony network. And so PBXs are one of the reasons that call spoofing exists today, and we're going to get into why that is. Uh, so to break up all of this like acronym hell, I have some fun facts. Uh, so telephony fun fact, the word hello was actually encouraged to be used as the telephone greeting by Thomas Edison. Uh, and so this word didn't actually exist until 1827. So today you learned. Uh, so let, let's like break this up now into what the problem is, which is unwanted robocalls, right? Like this is kind of what we started talking about. Um, this is something that like everybody here is very familiar with this fact that we get a lot of calls that are being probably spoofed to us. Like we don't know who they're coming from. If you call that number back, it's either going to some kind of deadline or it's going to call into some kind of system that's been set up to scam you. Uh, and this has gotten super common in the last five to ten years for a few main reasons. Uh, one, that automated dialing is now super cheap with things like SIP and VoIP. Um, especially in the last like ten years, you now have a lot more access points to the PSTN that allows you to do this programmatically and very cheaply. Uh, there's also like 4,000 service providers in the U.S. And so you have a lot of like long tail service providers and a lot of different out routes to get into the PSTN now. And so this makes enforcing, like, uh, validating where the calls are coming from a lot harder. And there's also a lot uh, of varied quality in these service providers and what they're going to enforce in terms of how they allow spoofing in the network. Um, and then finally, there isn't that validation on that from number. Uh, and we'll talk about why that is. But, uh, you know, this is like an app that I downloaded on iOS that like you can just download this app and then like place a call to anybody that you want from whatever number you want. They do end up charging you if you place more than like two calls, but like they don't actually care. And I thought that maybe even Apple would try to enforce this, but even Apple was like, cool, whatever. This is technically legal because this has some uh, terms of service. Uh, and so one of the main follow-ups to this is like, okay, well, why is this legal, right? Like, why don't we just ban all robocalls and all spoofing? And there's a few reasons for that. Like, automated calls, like, there might be reasons that you want automated calls. And so, like, wanted automated calls include things like, you know, your kid's school is closed or, you know, your prescription is ready to pick up. So, like, you can't just outlaw all robocalling for that. But then there's also legitimate reasons for call spoofing which gets back to a lot of these PBX use cases. And so when these businesses and enterprises would set up their uh, conference or their company lines in this way, 
you, every single person would have like a direct inbound dialer number, but in order to call out to say a customer or something, what the company would set up that PBX to do was all outbound calls would come from in a spoofed number or a masked overridden from number, the company main line or the company contact center. And so this is something that existed for a long time. It still exists today. So that if you, you know, are like an insurance company and you know, you have all of the agents that maybe you can contact on a direct line, if that agent ever needs to call out from the company, they are actually calling out from a spoof number that has the company contact center, like 1-800 number in front of it. Another use case for this is things like doctors calling you from their personal um, like, or office phones. They probably want that number to show up as the office uh, number so that if you need to call back, you're getting the receptionist or you're getting like a main line that can then be directed to voicemail or the appropriate person if that's uh, the case. And so this is how telephony was set up like many years ago and why you know it kind of makes sense that we would have this. There's obviously like a lot more new ways that people are dealing with this with like proxy numbers that aren't actually using spoofing. But for companies that existed before there was like telephony APIs like Twilio, there was a lot of uh, precedent for doing number spoofing in a legitimate way that wasn't intended to defraud. But the FCC kept getting a lot of complaints about this, and so they were like, okay, we have to do something. And so in 2009, they did the Truth and Caller ID Act. And so this says that it is illegal to spoof calls, but only if they have the intent to defraud, cause harm, or wrongly obtain anything of value. So that's cool. But like, the problem with this is that it's also practically impossible to enforce this law. You remember the slide where like the telephony network today has a bunch of like bunch of carriers within it. Like you have a situation where service providers are all passing along your call to the correct one in order to get it to the end uh, provider that actually can contact your phone. So sometimes there's like five or ten hops within the PSTM before a uh, call actually gets through to you. And this is all automated now, and this doesn't take that long. But if you complain to the FCC about a spoofed call or a spam call. Tracking that down, if they don't have enough complaints about that number, is going to take a lot of time. It's going to uh, take a lot of effort, and therefore, it's going to take some money to track this down. And it's like, it's you know, it's technically possible, but a lot of times, unless they have like a concerted, uh, you know, they're on to like some kind of major scammer about this, it's taking them a lot more effort than they practically have the resources to do in order to track down these bad actors. And so this call, Truth and Caller ID Act is like really difficult to enforce, which is why like things have only gotten worse since 2009. This hasn't actually prevented most spam callers. Uh, so hello is a standard greeting now, but another fun fact, uh, Alexander Graham Bell, the inventor of the telephone, uh, he actually campaigned to use the words ahoy hoy as the uh, standard telephony greeting. So uh, next time your parents call you, I you know, tell you to answer the phone, ahoy hoy, and see what they say, and just, you know, that could be fun. All right, cool. And now let's talk about shake and stir. Uh, this brings me to the solutions. Uh, so like I said, this is kind of like an egregious backronym. Uh, so stir, I think, came first, which is the scared telephony identity revisited. Uh, and then shaken, you know, to match the James Bond theme, is signature-based handling of acts asserted information using tokens. It gets worse though. There's a proposal to extend this called Lemon Twist, which is leveraging. Oh, I'm, you can't. You just don't even read that. That's it's too much. It's too much. I'm so sorry. You can figure out what that is in the slides later. But anyway, as the FCC describes it, Shaken and Stir uh, will have calls have their caller ID signed as legitimate by the originating carrier and validated by other carriers before reaching the consumer. And so this is you know. If you're familiar with TLS, you're doing that transport layer security in a way of the phone call. You're ensuring that the person who placed the call has access to that telephone number and that you know that the telephone number that they're using hasn't been changed in transport before it gets routed to the end user. You know, unlike web requests and that kind of thing though, like the actual communications that are going through, like text messages and phone calls, they're not encrypted, right? You're not actually like encrypting your voice communications once the call is connected over the PSTN, but you can sign the actual phone number and assert that the phone number is from the person who it belongs to as part of this legislation or as part of this technology. 
And so we're not reinventing the wheel here. We're borrowing from other web authentication. And so uh, Shake and Stir uses things like public key infrastructure. It uses certificates. It's using JSON web tokens. Um, and if you're familiar at all with like email validation, like email industry went through a very similar uh, uh, conundrum a few years ago uh, where they basically had to validate from senders on emails and they introduced something called DKIM and DMARC. So if you've ever dealt with that, um, I saw a really interesting panel uh, last year from some of the people that were behind DKIM and DMARC talking to some of the people that are behind Shaken and Stir and talking about some of the challenges that they're going to have implementing this going forward and like what the rollout's going to look like. Uh, but you know these are these are not like new technologies that we're using here. We're just kind of applying it to a new use case. Uh, so this is a simplified view of what the shake and stir signing and validation process will look like. Uh, so the signing service is going to include the public key infrastructure and the key management there. And the originating service provider will have to do that key management, but they will have one private key and they'll have to manage the public keys for the other US service providers. So one of the common criticisms of shake and stir is like, you know, rolling this out isn't like super straightforward. Like PKI is hard. Not every telephony network or service provider has like PKI that they know how to implement right. But on the bright side, like there is only about 4,000 other public keys that they're going to have to manage. And you compare that to like managing SSL certificates or the internet or something like that. There's like millions of SSL certificates that we have to manage for, uh, for the web. And so, you know, you're, you're not dealing with like three other companies anymore, but the number is still relatively low. And there are going to be certificate authorities and a policy administrator involved in this that are going to help do kind of the management of this process and make sure that the certificates issued are going to be uh, authentic, uh, authenticated and valid. Um, and so what's going to happen is at the other end, the callee, uh, so it's up to the client, and so this is going to be hardware manufacturers, so people like Apple and Google, closely in contact with major US carriers, so like AT&T, Verizon, and T-Mobile are very, very involved in a lot of this, but it's going to be up to the clients to decide how to display trust at the other end. And so some of the ways that they're looking at doing this is like literally adding green check marks to calls, adding that caller verified to the call screen. You might get into something what we're calling rich call data, or RCD, which is going to be start displaying uh, information about the businesses itself, basically kind of trying to recreate the process of caller ID, uh, but with a new like signed certificate uh, in, in that kind of PKI world. Uh, so a little bit more information about these certificate authorities. Uh, and so this is all managed by ATIS, or the uh, Alliance for Telecommunications Industry Standards. Uh, and so these are the same people that are the, uh, the standards body who are authoring the shaken spec. Uh, and ATIS is also uh, has this like STIGA, or the Se Secure Telephony Identity Governance Authority. And they're the ones that put out the call to uh, have companies apply to be certificate authorities. Uh, and so these are companies like Newstar and TransNexus have been announced. I know there's a couple that have also been approved that haven't been like formally announced yet. I think there's going to be seven certificate authorities in total. Um, but this is all still like happening right now. This is all relatively new. And so they're still in the process of like rolling out who these certificate authorities are going to be and announcing that. So you might see more announcements around that in the next couple of months. So as a reminder, SIP is the way of originating VoIP calls into the telephony network. And as part of that, it has this identity header that's being introduced in terms of the shaken spec. Uh, so this is what a SIP header looks like currently. You don't really have to read that super carefully. But uh, you can see that there's like the metadata included there. And I highlighted the from header. Uh, and this is where the problem is, is that currently the from number can be spoofed here, this from identity, and it's up to the service provider to uh, validate that you're not spoofing that or disallow that. And again, like we can't just make this illegal or completely bar this for everyone because there are some use cases where companies still need this for legitimate reasons. And so uh, one of the things that you now have to do is validate that the, the from header in a shaken world is going to be who it says it is. And the way that we're doing that is by introducing this identity header. Uh, and so this is a base 64 encoded JSON web token. Uh, if you're interested in JSON web tokens, I think there's a session right after lunch that talks more about them. Uh, so you can learn more about that there. But I'm going to focus on, there's a, a several pieces of information that are going to be encoded in this, uh, in this jot. 
but I'm going to focus on some of the information that's encoded in that middle section there. Uh, and so this middle section is including information uh, like the attestation level, and we'll talk more about what that means on the next slide, but this is basically uh, how confident the originating service provider, so say I'm calling um, you know, my friend Kat, uh, I'm calling from a Verizon number, Cat's on AT&T, Verizon is the originating service provider there, uh, and this is how much Verizon says that they trust my number. Um, you know, who and where the call is coming from, who it's going to, uh, and then the originating ID at the bottom there, the customer ID there is going to be really important for this because this is what allows us to nearly instantly identify bad actors. Uh, and so this is what's going to make it possible to enforce the Truth in Caller ID Act because you have pieces of information here like the originating provider, the attestation level, and so you're saying that like Verizon knows that they own this number and they're trusting it. So Verizon's putting themselves on the line here and putting their reputation on the line, but then that origination ID is also tying it back to me specifically, to me as the Verizon customer. And so they know that if they trust that and they let that call go through the network and people start complaining about me, that they can come shut off my service. And so that's going to be a much quicker path to identifying bad actors than what we currently have. So these are the three levels of attestation that are uh, allowed under the SIP identity header. And so none of these levels is saying like, I think this person's spam. These are all saying that like, I am allowing this with some level of confidence. And so attestation A, this is probably what you're going to need in order to have some kind of green check mark or caller verified show up in the end client. So that's Verizon saying like, hey, I know that this is Kelly. I know Kelly is my customer and I know Kelly has access to use this number. B is saying like, I know Kelly, but like she's calling from a number that I don't know she had, is what that would kind of mean. Uh, and then C is the attestation level of saying like, I don't actually know who this is, but I know that this number is coming through my network and I know that I'm the one that's uh, originating the call here. And so this is you know, a little bit less uh, authoritative than an A level attestation, but they're still not saying that this is going to be spam even at a C level. Uh, and so the, the idea behind this is that a shaken signed call is far less likely to be a fraudulent call because these originating service providers are putting their reputation on the line. So all of this new technology is great, but we also kind of need to make sure that people are actually implementing it. I mentioned that there's like 4,000 plus service providers in the US. It's a lot of people that we need to like kind of cat herd in order to make sure that this gets done. And one way that we're doing that is there actually have US regulation that was signed into law at the very end of 2019. Uh, and so it's called the TRACE Act, which is the Telephone Robocall Abuse Criminal Enforcement Deterrence. These acronyms are killing me. But anyway, this was signed into law uh, December 30th, so like just a few weeks ago. Um, the Senate passed this last May, so you may have been he hearing about this throughout 2019 as like a way that the Senate and the House are, are addressing the robocall problem. Uh, but this one allows a, a fine of up to $10,000 for offenders. Um, and two, it also implements requirements for implementing uh, call authentication in the next 18 months. And there's a couple of ways that call authentication is translated, and it depends on the type of call that you're placing. So for VoIP calls, or for things that are initiated with like SIP headers that can, can be uh, authenticated with Shake and Stir, they're requiring that VoIP calls implement uh, Stir Shaken for this. Uh, for non-VoIP calls, which is still a part of the telephony network, uh, there's not really, you can't just apply Shaken to things that don't have SIP headers uh, as part of the call initiation. Uh, and so their verbiage for that is like reasonable measures to implement an effective call authentication framework. So we're not really sure what that means yet. Newstar has a product that they call Stir Out of Band for non-VoIP authentications. So it, it's basically like the, the House and Senate acknowledging that there isn't a good solution for non-VoIP calls yet. Um, people are looking at uh, solutions for this, but one of the main motivations of Shake and Stir and this uh, legislation behind it is to start to sunset some of the older products because there's a lot of benefits. Like the newer ways of initiating calls are actually a lot cheaper. Uh, and like the reason that the old stuff still exists is because it works, you know, the, the wires have already been laid, like the call quality is pretty good. And so there isn't like a lot of motivation for people to switch off that system if that's been what's working for them. 
And so this is part of the motivation to get uh, people to upgrade their telephony infrastructure. All right, I got another fun fact. Are you ready? Uh, not every 555 number is fake. So this is one that I actually learned recently. There's only about like 100 numbers that are actually reserved. Well, I guess this includes every area code, but 100 numbers on every area code that are actually reserved for fake numbers. The rest, you could actually get a real call or have a real number that includes 555 in it. So especially in LA, I feel like all these like movies and stuff use 555 for those numbers. Come on, y'all, set up a fun number. Get, get a fun Easter egg inside of that. Um, cool. So let's, let's talk about some of the limitations of shake and stir, right? Like this isn't going to solve all the problems. As my coworker Randy likes to say, one of the limitations of the shake and stir is that just like the phone network is an ungodly beast. So this is something that existed for like well over 100 years. This has been around for a long time. And, you know, there's a lot of infrastructure out there that we're going to have to upgrade. I talked about the non-VoIP uh, call that, you know, sh the, the Trace Act actually calls out as a potential limitation uh, to enforcement. Uh, and so non-VoIP calls, part of that and part of the ungodly beast of the telephony network is something called TDM or time division multiplexing because, you know, of course, um, just thought I'd throw one more acronym at you. This is basically the opposite of VoIP, right? Old school hardware, it was originally used for um, telegrams, and so it was a way for uh, telegrams to uh, send multiple telegrams over the same line. And so it's one way that you can basically implement efficiencies over uh, wired communications. So it's, it's you know cool technology and also like works pretty well, but like this is something that isn't going to be able to be signed with like a shake and sip header and something like that. And so the trace stack calls this out as burdens or barriers to the implementation, including for providers of voice service to the extent the networks of such providers use time division multiplexing. So like they're, they're going to like revisit this in 12 months and say like, how hard has this been for people to move off of these systems and then reevaluate and uh, update the kind of requirements for implementation, implementing call authentication at the end of 2020? So part of the problem with this is like shaken only applies to part of the telephony network. It's a large part of the telephony network at this point in time, but there's still a lot of uh, callers in the US that are not using VoIP calling. And so one of the limitations is that Shaken doesn't apply to that side of the telephony network. Uh, next thing uh, is just that there's a long tail of service providers. So, you know, 4,000 plus service providers, you've got your big names out there, your Comcast, your Verizons that have like publicly stated that they're committing to implementing this. But because this is like public key infrastructure, you have to have both parties on either end of the call and every party in between that's like willing to pass along this call authentication in order for a call to actually be authenticated end to end. And so if not everybody in the call and the telephony network has implemented this, your like PKI isn't really worth anything if you end up uh, communicating with a uh, terminating service provider that doesn't have any authentication built into their their systems yet. And it does require a significant investment to comply with this. And so, you know, it, this is not like, there is a lot of consumer pressure to make this happen. And there are a lot of service providers, like I don't think this is like going to be the end all be all of it. Like there are the regulations to uh, enforce that people do this. And a lot of uh, service providers are kind of betting on this as a strategic business decision because it allows like, one of the things that Shaken does really well is it's helping to restore trust in the telephony network. Anybody that's placing calls is making money off the calls once they actually get picked up. And so they want to increase pickup rates, right? And so they want to increase the likelihood that somebody is going to answer the calls on the other end. And part of doing that is making the call authentication a reality. And I'm also not sure yet what the penalty for not implementing is. Um, and that might be part of like the $10,000 fine, but uh, there hasn't been a lot of precedent for that yet in this new shaken world. And there's a couple other things that we have to consider, right? Like phone numbers get disconnected and ported all the time. Like how are we going to handle that? Uh, what about international numbers? This is all like very specific to the US and US service providers. And then what about text messages? Like obviously we're starting to talk about like a different communication medium there. Uh, and verified SMS is something that like Google has been working on. But this is still something that like this isn't going to solve. It, you know, it's not a silver bullet. So I just kind of wanted to highlight that. All right, one more fun fact. So 
the New York Times used to spoof all of their phone calls from this number. So if you got a call until the year 2011 from 111, 111, 1111, it was from the New York Times, and people got really confused about this. So I think they might still be spoofing their, their from number, but now it's like a 212 number that you can actually call back, and it says, like, welcome to the New York Times, you know. What do you need help with, and that kind of thing. And so previously, it, you couldn't really do much by calling back that 111 number. But this is an example of like how people were somewhat legitimately using uh, call spoofing uh, uh, in, in their businesses. All right, so what happens next? Uh, there is some ongoing legislation. Uh, so last year, uh, the FCC actually gave telcos the authority to block unwanted robocalls. And the reason that this was important is because they gave them the authority to do that without getting your permission first. And so one of the previous things was like, you know, uh, we like to have control over our own kind of destiny there, and so they wanted to make sure that you were allowing that. But now, you know, if you use Verizon or you use AT&T or T-Mobile or something like that, they may be blocking potential spam calls on your behalf already. Uh, and then kind of as I mentioned, the Trace stack is going to start in, uh, beginning enforcement and kind of laying out what that enforcement is going to look like in 12 to 18 months. Uh, so 12 months is when they start deciding what they're going to do about non-VoIP calls, and 18 months is the current deadline for what they're going to do uh, for when they expect enforcement for shaken and stir on VoIP calls. All right, and motivations driving the implementation. So FCC number one complaint from consumers is still uh, is still robocalls, and so they have a lot of motivation to kind of just like get the consumers off their backs uh, because they're triaging a lot of complaints from consumers right now. So there's the consumer pressure to decrease robocalls, but then there's also this business pressure to increase answered calls that I kind of talked about. Uh, and so there's a lot of businesses like you know if you're CVS, you really want people like picking up that call. If you're DoorDash, you really want people like answering that call from the driver that says your food is there, right? Like that's another example of like calls that aren't from a number that you probably know, but a call that you might want to answer. Uh, and so for all the application security folks in this room, like there are some things that you can start to think about today. Um, so is anybody here like responsible for their company's phone systems? Well, that's good. That makes things easier. But there are some there's some things that you can take uh, into consideration about like how your company is set up and how you might be able to protect your company. So things like protecting your numbers from web scraping bots. Don't post like everybody's numbers online or post only one contact number for your business. Um, assigning sequential numbers. You know this is an opportunity for fuzzing for your employees. Um, if you can have a contact center, there's a couple of things that you can do to uh, protect your agents and protect protect your uh, customers' accounts from potential scammers. Uh, and so, you know, if you're worried about robocalling into your contact center, you can protect that with a voice capture. Those are things that exist. Um, and then if you're worried about, like, social engineering in your contact center, which is kind of a different thing, but, like, even using actual authentication in your contact centers is something that, like, a lot of folks aren't doing right now. Uh, you know, you think about contact centers, most people are still using, like, Verify your birth date. That's not actually authentication, right? Um, and then if you are somebody that even knows what a PBX is, like apparently that's no one in this room, but there is a FCC. Not, not that you don't know what that's, that is, but that you're no one in this room admitted to being somebody that's responsible for your company's PBX, which is, again, probably for the best. All right, and then as a consumer, stuff that you can do uh, to the extent with which you trust these apps uh, to be installed on your own phone, uh, things like Nobo, Robo, Robo Killer, Call App, and Haya are apps for consumers that you can use in order to either detect calls as spam or potentially block those calls from ever reaching you. Some of them may send them straight to voicemail. Some of them are starting to add some of that rich call data in so that you might get information about potential uh, legitimate callers that might be calling you. Uh, and so again, like some of these like require that they, you give them all of the permissions and access to everything in your phone, so your mileage may vary there. But as an example, AT&T has a strong partnership with Haya, and so Haya uh, has an app that can be installed on AT&T phones that actually enriches data in, uh, in your phone that says information about potential spam calls. 
So kind of just wrapping this up, like telephony is complicated or an ungodly beast, as my coworker likes to say. You know, I, I think it's something that we're going to see uh, change more towards the better, more towards this kind of regulated, uh, standardized world in the future. But it's a complicated thing that we're still working through. And we've got a lot of centuries of history to kind of sift through before we can have solutions. Shake and stir is interesting, but, you know, it's not going to fix everything. But it is something that's going to help us rebuild trust in the telephony network in the same way that we now trust uh, potential websites that have that SSL certificate in the URL bar. So once again, my name is Kelly Robinson. If you have any questions, uh, we have some time for that. And thank you for listening. Start with the back over here. Thanks. Um, I have a couple of questions. Um, so the first one with the uh, JWT token that gets put in, is each provider in the chain supposed to like add their own or you like just keep the first one and everyone verifies it down the way? I think it's the latter, but I'm not totally positive about that. But I don't think that you're modifying it in transit. I think part of what the signature is is explicitly saying that you're not modifying the call that's being transmitted or the information. Yeah. Yeah, let me find. Um, where did that go? Here. So this is actually, um, I skipped that slide. Why did it? I don't want to show that. Um, OK, it's because I am intentionally skipping it. Oh, so anyway, this side uh, is what's having the cryptographic signature in it. And this is also what's showing like the originating certificate URL. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Let me do that now. Sorry about that. There. So this like the last part of it is what has the cryptographic signature in it and the certificate URL. And then there's some other information like passport types and stuff in there that I don't know a ton about. Uh, and then my other question was in terms of vulnerability reporting, I mean, there's like two talks at this conference about like how JWT is super insecure and lots of people make implementation errors in verifying them. Is there any requirement to like if one of these people down the way doesn't verify JWT tokens properly, like they need to fix it within a certain time frame and any of that? So kind the of stuff trace right stack now? specifically doesn't address that, and I think that's one of the things that's going to be interesting like moving forward. And I kind of talked about like PKI is hard, and part of that is like implementing JOTs, right? And so right now I don't think there's any specific penalties for that, but what might happen like for that specific implementation error, but what might happen is that people might get hit with fines if the actual service provider has an insecure implementation. Yeah, yeah. yeah. great talk. I have a quick question. What is a voice capture? A voice capture is a way of authenticating that like you are a human. And so I think there's different ways of doing this. Like there's probably providers for this. Um, there's some company, Pindrop, I think, does voice captures is one company that does it. Um, but I think I think it's probably like a SaaS product that you would use, honestly. Hey, I know you said that uh, the future is going to be better because we'll have this uh, sign thing. But for right now, is there uh, technology available? So we, we get spoofed calls, but they're internal. So it looks like it's Sally or whatever it is comes up on my, my phone and I answer it. And it's like, you, you know, we're going to arrest you. You haven't paid your taxes. You know, and I'm <laughs> like, I called her and I, she said, it wasn't me. So I went and talked to the, the dudes that worked the, the system and I go, can't you like reject a caller ID that's coming in from outside that is supposed to be inside? So is this so this is something that like it's posing to somebody within your internal yeah. like network, your yeah. internal PBX. Yeah, yeah, I would talk to your IT department about they, that. The guy said we can't do it. It's an open <laughs> standard, and we can't block. Uh, so B PBXs like they're not all wired anymore. There's a lot of like IP based PBXs now, yeah, and yeah. so yeah, like they. <laughs> They can it's worse, do something then about it. Because you think it. it's trusted. It's an the problem is, is like they can do something about it, but right now it's like it requires them basically going and contacting who they got that call from, and then that service provider is like, oh yeah, yeah, we passed that along, and they're like, but we didn't originate that, so let me go talk to this guy over here, and like you might get to like five or ten hops at that point, and so like it's something that people just aren't really willing to invest in tracing down right now. Zero yeah, zero trust. <laughs> Kelly? Yeah. I'm curious about the FCC blacklist that you covered. And just like this is similar to some of the email protections, 
companies and individuals may have ended up on a blacklist and getting off of those blacklists can oftentimes be kind of cryptic and you end up on those blacklists from people spoofing things like your email address. So if, is it possible that someone could spoof an originating ID and cause a company to get onto a blacklist and then how do they get off of that? How do they also validate that it wasn't them? That's a great question. I have no idea. <laughs> Uh, I think this is like part of the thing is like we haven't actually implemented most of this yet. So these are the kinds of questions that we're going to be figuring out. Uh, I'll, I'll look into that because I, I don't know what the current plan is. Yeah, th that particular vector is actually becoming hot and heavy right now. We're seeing quite a few actors out there. So effectively just saying, I'm Bob and I'm going to piss off a bunch of people and I'm going to get on all these nasty lists, right? That's easy to do. That's been going on. That vector has been around for quite some time in the telephony world. Now, I used to actually work on the fraud team at level three, and uh, the amount of requests that we got level on a regular a basis was overwhelming. And to get someone off a blacklist was an act of God and usually a sacrifice involved. <laughs> um, it's gotten slightly better, uh, especially with uh, companies like Twilio, things that are going away from the old school telephony to the you know more modern technology, but it still is at least a chicken or two to get off that list. Hi, Kelly. This is an odd question because it came in late, but we're talking about new infrastructure for telephony, and uh, most of us got caught up years ago in lawful intercept, which is uh, actually if we authenticate people and use SSL and do all this stuff, suddenly now lawful intercept becomes kind of challenging. Do you have I, any thoughts on it? Lawful intercept, like if uh, law enforcement wants to... Well. Back around 2000, there were all these changes that happened in telephony equipment because of the Patriot Act, uh, such that carriers, Ericsson, all these guys, would provide an ability for the government to monitor telephone calls <clears throat> without the knowledge of the provider completely. Uh, and they could then just listen in to stuff, assuming they had a correct warrants and stuff. And it was so onerous that when uh, a company in China might have borrowed a design for some large company's telephone switch, um, Lawful Intercept worked over there, too, <laughs> to the benefit of our country, of course. Yeah. But these, these kind of intrusions, there's law, law in, case, in place that allows companies to monitor their employees' communications and governments to m monitor... Uh, uh, individual stuff, and there's actually even a wiki page and a standard about it. This oh, is nice. how bad it is. Yeah, I mean, the so what this is doing is is encrypting and signing the originating phone number. It's not encrypting or encoding any of the actual communications. Uh, and so I'm guessing that because of that, like, the transport layer for telephony is still going to be an unencrypted, like, voice call that if they have that infrastructure in place, like they might be able to continue using that. Uh, one more question. Sure. Um, has Twilio implemented this yet? And if so, have you run into any issues with like, corresponding parties not verifying things or something like that? Uh, so we're working on it. Uh, and the, so like one of the things that like my team is working on right now is in order for us to add any attestation to your call, like your outbound call, we have to know who you are. And so, uh, there's a lot of different laws globally, and like just this is like a Twilio specific thing that when we implement things, we try to do it like for a global scale. Uh, and so there's a lot of laws globally about like how you can have access to a phone number. So it's like much more difficult to get a phone number in Germany than it is in the US. And so in order for somebody to have like an attestation level A at Twilio, what they're going to have to start doing is creating a business profile that we're working on the validation for that profile right now. Um, in terms of rolling it out, we haven't gotten to the point where we're like, actually like run into issues with other providers because also it's like not enforced yet. And there's like, there's not the end benefit on most calls yet about uh, how we're going to be showing this. Um, this is what I think T-Mobile and Android is displaying right now and so, if you have an Android phone or an, or, and are on T-Mobile, you might have already seen this. Um, but not every provider has implemented like this end state either. 
potential spam is what's showing up too. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I know a lot of people are flagging things as potential spam, um, and then, but like I think what, a lot of what Shake and Stir is doing is like getting towards kind of like the uh, the thumbs up instead of the thumbs down. <laughs> uh, do you have a mic for the recording? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, hi. Um, so great talk. I had a question about the um, attestation. Uh, in particular, I think what I'm wondering about is 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 the intent with attestation to provide a grade of uh, like what is believed to be trust to the end receiver of the call. And my question is really thinking from a consumer's point of view and like really putting myself in the, like my, my parents' point of view. It's like they just want to know, is this good or not? Yeah. Like they don't want to have to understand a complicated grading system. So is the intent like for, for like us to try and provide as much as we can or is the end result hoping that we can just get to the point where it's like the call is legit or not? So honestly, like, and this is one of the things that still is like I'm wondering about is because we have these three levels of attestation, uh, it's going to be like what what does the end client do when they get a B or C? And that's where like the standards haven't like decided that the regulations, like the Trace Act, hasn't decided that. I think what we'll end up seeing is like it's either A or spam. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Like I, th I'm, I'm guessing if I had to like right. put my my thoughts on this, but that's not because there's any regulation enforcing that. Okay. But yeah, your your point is ex exactly correct, right? Like we yeah. don't. There isn't the standard of like what we do when we get an A or a B or a C and how we display that. That's still going to be up to the uh, device manufacturers and the carriers. Right. Okay, so I actually had another question about something um, different, which is with regards to verifying the signatures. Okay. Um, so if you have multiple stops along the way of getting a call to that end receiver and you're, you have you know, multiple carriers verifying the signature, um, with regards to the gentleman's question earlier of how difficult it is to implement these kinds of things, um, if you saw a discrepancy with one carrier, but then all the other carriers said it was legit, like what happens? What do you, what, is the standard accommodating for this, this case where there's you know, one person saying something and everybody else is fine, or do you stop it when you find the discrepancy? Like what, what happens? I don't know yet. Okay. I'll have to look into that. Thank you. Sure. Okay. <laughs> we have one more up front. <clears throat> Yeah, I'm definitely going to be looking into more of like what happens along the, like the layer once things get passed along because I think that, at least from the research that I did, isn't clear to me yet. Um, so my question is like, where are other countries at? Like, has Europe where they ahead of us? Like, the where the payment card or? Yeah, so one of the reasons that the U.S. is so uh, on top of this is mostly because it's cheapest to do this in the U.S. right now. So I know talking to people in the U.K. and some other countries, like, they just don't have this problem as much. And I don't know if it's, like, that there's fewer carriers in those other countries or fewer service providers, but I'm not aware specifically of any other laws in those countries that are being implemented. Um, and most of that is because, like, spam calling hasn't become as proliferant in those areas. So I think we'll probably get to like, you know, Europe is usually on the forefront of these things, but uh, it might get to the point where, uh, you know, they're using similar technology to validate calls globally. But for the time being, all of this that I talked about is pretty specific to the U.S. Um, whoa, that's loud. Um, how... Uh, are you aware of how well the shake and stir, the additional headers tacked onto the SIP initiation uh, are compatible with other SIP headers for other processes such as DTLS, CRTP? Um, when that's you're trying to do a lot of acronyms that I don't know what okay. that is. Uh, <laughs> it's a, for that's a process for using SIP headers to end-to-end -end encrypt calls on either end, okay. which is distinct from this because this is verification on the carrier level. Yeah. But I'm wondering if if there's anything in the standard that is about supporting other pre-existing SIP technologies that also have headers inside your SIP requests that are getting passed through your PBXs. Yeah, so short answer is I don't know, but longer answer is like SIP is like for a lot of com communications that aren't just voice calling, and so I'm guessing that not everything is going to be compatible here because it also doesn't have to just involve phone numbers, right? Like those SIP from headers don't actually have phone numbers in them. I they were lists. Yeah, like... <laughs> So th this is, um, so like the, the from header there is like a SIP information and that one has a phone number in it, but like, you know, this is like the destination could be to multiple phone numbers. Uh, so there's other information kind of encoded in, uh, in the SIP header that like could include other 
uh, communications methods, I guess. So, yeah. That probably doesn't answer your question, but we'll figure it out. All right, one more uh, round of applause here for Kelly. Thank you so much. Fantastic talk.